Good morning, friends. My name is Claire Mitchell. This morning, we're going to be continuing in our Ten Commandments series. Today's text is going to be Exodus 20, 15, you shall not steal. This is the word of the Lord. You might remember in 2008, um, the U.S. went through what's known as the, the housing crisis. And basically what, what happened there, um, a heck of a lot of loans were made for homes that people couldn't ultimately afford due to a number of circumstances. Um, because lots of people were defaulting on their homes, um, giant banks began to fail, a billion dollar companies collapsed, and then there were ripples around the world. It wasn't just a housing crisis in the U.S., it was also a, a worldwide uh, global financial crisis that uh, plunged millions of people back into poverty, some who had uh, kind of climbed out of that in some ways. And so there were people who starved to death as a result of a housing crisis that happened right here in the United States. Now, um, we'll talk in a little bit about all of the reasons for that, but I believe that it really boils down to one thing, theft, a violation of the commandment that we're going to look at here today. Um, in Exodus chapter 20, God is speaking to his people, the nation of Israel, and he's teaching them how to live. He's giving them kind of the central moral component of the Old Testament law, and he's very clear on this one. There's not a whole lot of wiggle room. He simply says, you shall not steal. Now, it's interesting, this commandment, um, George Barnett did a survey uh, a few years ago and asked people about the various commandments of God, the various moral things we find in scriptures, and 87% of people um, um, agreed that this commandment was a good one. Like, we like that one. We don't want people to steal our stuff. Um, God got it right on this one. Um, we agree. Now, these are believers and unbelievers, by the way, and so not everyone uh, believes in God the way that, that, that we do, but ultimately, most people said stealing is bad. Now, you got to wonder about the other 13%. They're like, yeah, I don't care. People can come get my stuff. Um, doesn't really bother me. Uh, I hope you're not one of those. But as the people of God who believe that He is the Lord, the God who created it all, who set the world into motion and has ordered it in such a way that is ultimately for our good and the highest good for this world. We trust God when he says that we should not steal. Now, 87% of people agree, um, but I wonder if they would agree with all of it. Today, we're going to talk about three different ways in which we could violate this commandment and what that would ultimately mean for it. So how do we steal? Most people think about, when they think about theft, they think about stealing somebody's money or their stuff, right? This is kind of how it goes. When I was a little kid, I was in the grocery store with my mom. Um, there were predatory vendors that put out the little Brock's candy display, and I could not help myself. I grabbed the candy. I put it in my pocket. My mom me later, and I had to go back and apologize and pay for the candy. Now, that's a small way that it happens, but um, it does. Throughout our lives, we're tempted to steal because we want something that someone else has. The first way that we steal is by theft of property, theft of money, um, choosing to take something that belongs to someone else. Maybe you're, uh, you know, the jealous type, right? You're a guy who likes tools and your buddy's got the tool, right? And you have a, an opportunity to get the tool, but not by paying for it. You swipe it or maybe at work, they got some tools on the truck that you might could utilize at home. And so you take those and keep them as your own. Now, this commandment doesn't allow any carve-outs, right? There's no caveats. It's don't steal unless. It's not don't steal uh, except in the case of. It's just very clear. We should not take what is not ours under any circumstances. Now, our, in our world, we like to find the ethical exceptions to the rule, don't we? Uh, we might celebrate the Robin Hood who steals from the rich in order to distribute and help the poor. Uh, and yet the scriptures are clear, even if you're Robin Hood, you should not steal from other people. Uh, maybe to bring it home a little bit more for you and I, even if your company is underpaying you and overworking you, even if they're making massive profits off the backs of, of someone else's labor and polluting the environment while they do it, you should not steal, right? There are no carve-outs, no caveats. We simply shouldn't do this. As we seek to reflect God to the world, as his people, light in the midst of darkness, theft should never be a part of our conversation. Um, now, when it comes to employers, by the way, 
Because this is a, a common place where people like to, to steal, or maybe we justify it a little bit. And they ask questions, well, what am I allowed to take? You know, am I, you know what about the pens? The promotional pens, can I have those? Or, uh, you know, we had excess inventory, I'm allowed to maybe bring that home. Um, or just a good rule of thumb for you in your workplace, because we want to represent Christ there well, to be people of God and of integrity there. Um, rule of thumb, if they haven't explicitly given it, we shouldn't take it, right? If they say, you know, ha- help yourself to it, by all means, go get it. But if they haven't, you, f- you should probably ask before you, you take extra things home. Also, by the way, um, this type of theft, it includes uh, the semi-permanent bar- borrowing that often happens where you borrow something from somebody and then you wake up six months later and think, ooh, I never returned this, but then it's been so long you're embarrassed to go back and admit it, so you just decide to keep it. That's also stealing. You should go have the conversation and take the thing back. Now, there's one other sort of stealing uh, that would fall under this classification. So we can steal from people, we can steal from entities or businesses, we can steal from the government, and we can also steal from God. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. The prophet Malachi, speaking to the people of God, he asks him a question. He says, will man rob God? Would you really steal from God? And yet you are robbing me, but you say, how have we robbed you? He says, in your tithes and in your contributions. Now, under the old covenant, part of the old covenant law, um, people were to give 10% of everything. You harvest your field, the first 10% would ultimately go to God. And so I I don't know what was happening during the days of Malachi. Um, Maybe the people were thinking, you know, I got to put back a little bit more money in case there's, you know, disaster. And so I'm not going to give my 10% to God. Or, you know, maybe the standard of living, they were wanting a little nicer this or that, and so they were, you know, shorting God a little bit on what he had required from them. We don't know what the motivation was, but we know that as believers in Jesus Christ, as God's people, we believe that God has given us everything that we have. He has entrusted it to us to steward as he would require. And while we're a new covenant people, we don't exist under the old covenant law that says we have to give 10% anymore, I would submit to you that God is still the Lord of our wealth. And then he would want us to be generous and sacrificial givers both to his church and to the world around us. And so we should strive to honor God in the way that we would spend our finances. And it may be that we would be tempted to commit this sin too, that rather than being generous toward God and other people, we up our standard of living, take the extra trip, buy the bigger house, or whatever it might be, and we could ultimately rob God. Now, again, we're not under the Old Testament law. We don't have to give 10%. But on this side of the cross, as people who have seen the Son of God crucified, that we might have new life in Him, um, we should certainly be motivated to steward our finances in a way that would honor the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So the first type of theft is just normal, run-of-the-mill theft of property. This, this happens. Uh, I heard about an account this week. Somebody got their scooter stolen. and So don't steal scooters, right? Don't, don't do that. That's sinful. The second type of theft is kidnapping. Um, some people, some commentators have actually argued that what God meant here when he said, you shall not steal, was the stealing of persons, um, kidnapping people, enslaving them, owning them, selling them. Um, I, I certainly think that this commandment encompasses stealing of people, but I don't think it's limited to that. I think, obviously, stealing of property is a part of this. Now, you probably, I don't know how you are, you probably haven't bought anyone in your lifetime. We don't have, you know, a slave trade going on here in in this day, uh, and and yet um, it's a part of our history as a nation. You know how it went. Um, The forceful taking of slaves generally happened on the African continent, not limited to there, Um, people were enslaved, they were brought here, they were purchased, they were bought and sold, and it it wasn't uh, a temporary uh, bond slave, you know, you you serve as a slave until your debt is paid off and then you're set free, Uh, but instead people were enslaved for life, and not just their life, but the lives of their children and on down the generations. What happened here in our country um, was detestable in the sight of God. The stealing of people and treating them as property um, When every man and woman was made in the image of God, they ultimately belonged to him. We should never treat them as our property. There were people that stood in pulpits and filled church pews who argued from the scriptures uh, that we should be able to enslave people. 
Now, the scriptures do speak to slavery at certain points. Uh, there's a passage in Deuteronomy that we'll take a look at here in just a second that does describe what happened with some slavery in the Old Testament. So, I, I want to be clear, I don't think we should ever go back and own slaves. I don't think it should ever happen anyway in the form of chattel slavery. However, in the Old Testament, there was a carve-out for this. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 12 through 17, this would govern among the Hebrew people how they would um, practice a form of more like indentured servitude, but I'll, I'll read it for you. It says this, If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you, that's for a debt, by the way. He shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year you shall let him go free. And when you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, out of your wine press. And as the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and that the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this today. But if he says to you, I will not go out from you. I like it here. I think I, I want to be a slave in your house. If he, if he says this to you, because he loves you and your household, since he's well off with you, then you shall take an awl and put it through his ear into the door, and he shall be your slave forever, and your female uh, slave shall do the same. Now, what this was, was among the nation of Israel, they were all children of God. They belonged to God, and yet they would find themselves indebted. They would find themselves on hard times. A family member dies. You can't keep up with what you've got going. And so what they would do, they would sell themselves um, for a number of years in order to pay off this sort of debt. And yet, this wasn't ownership. This was uh, to work off the debt. In the seventh year, you let him go free, right? Because he's a child made in the image of God. And then you enrich him from what you have um, out of your wine press, from your fields. Whatever God has blessed you with, you need to bless him as well. So I, I say all that. Um, don't ever let anyone tell you that the scriptures justify in any way the sort of slavery that was practiced here within the United States. Um, it is a blight on Christianity that people would justify their sins and try to use the scriptures to do so. I'm guessing this isn't a profound issue in your life. I really hope that that's true. And yet we have to be careful that we can't ever slip back into these sorts of sins which would allow us to justify the taking, the forceful taking of another person. All right? So we can, we can commit theft. We can steal by taking property or money. We can steal people. Um, but then there's a way that I'm not sure 87% of people would agree with. It's a way that hits a little closer to home for most of us. Um, the third way that we can steal is by cheating or by swindling. Now, you, you might think it sounds like you're just lying, uh, but anytime we would lie in order to take somebody from something from somebody that doesn't belong to us, it's ultimately theft. So here's what it looked like in the Bible. You'll see this throughout the scriptures, but um, we see it first, Proverbs 11.1. It says, dishonest scales are detestable to the Lord, but an accurate weight is his delight. So uh, if you were alive during this time, the writer of the Proverbs, all the way um, into the first century, the biblical writers, uh, a lot of the way that you would do business was, was based upon a scale. I want a certain amount of, of grain, and I'll give you this much money. And so you would weigh those things out, and hopefully you would have a proper scale that would reflect, uh, honestly, the amount of product someone was buying for the amount of money that they were giving. And yet, if you wanted to steal from somebody, get a little bit more money than what your product was worth, you would have a dis dishonest scale that would suggest, I'm giving you more product than, uh, or I'm giving more product than I actually am. That lets me take more money from you than I actually deserve. It's theft. I don't know the last time you did business with a scale, you know, weighed out, whatever. You might have done some of that in your lifetime. Um, and yet, we've got to be careful that in our dealings as the people of God, men and women who represent Christ in every transaction that we would participate in, um, that we don't defraud people, that we don't cheat, that we don't swindle. So here's a few ways that we might be tempted to cheat people, to steal um, by, by manipulating or being dishonest. Um, the first would be, uh, you might have experienced this in your life, uh, if you're like me and you've kind of driven, driven old ghetto vehicles in your life, uh, you know, when you're driving down the road and something happens and you're like, oh no, there's not much time left, the engine starts to knock or the transmission is starting to, like, oh man, this is not good. Um, now, we would be dishonest if we knew something like that about our vehicle, but then we go on Craigslist or on the marketplace and we post, 
Hey, great vehicle, great condition, perfect running order, probably has 100,000 miles left when you know the end is near. And if you would sell it at a price that would reflect your description rather than the actual condition of the car, that would be stealing from somebody. It's dishonesty in order to gain more from someone than we ultimately would deserve in the transaction. It's theft. So to misrepresent the quality or condition of a product when selling it is to steal. To embezzle money from your company, if you're in accounting, that's clearly stealing. To commit insurance fraud, because things are not going so well and you're not sure how you're going to pay for it, and so in some way you would pretend like there was some sort of insurance claim in your life that wasn't actually true, so your insurance company has to pay out. It's stealing. Students, cheating off of somebody at school, right? You, you take their work and represent it as yours in order to get a grade that you didn't actually earn. Stealing. This was a big one during my generation, growing up. Pirating music. Remember Napster? It was amazing, right? You could just get everything. That was stealing, right? So we weren't paying for the music. We would download it. Um, that is ultimately theft. But we can also do that uh, with movies, and we can do it with software as we get a little bit older. We don't want to pay for that expensive software we need for our business, and so we just steal it online. It's theft before God. Another way would be to engage in frivolous lawsuits, making claims about people that are untrue in order to enrich ourselves. We can do this by um, making claims for governmental benefits that we don't ultimately deserve. So disability, welfare, unemployment claims, or we're going to milk the government for all it's worth even if we don't ultimately need that. It's stealing something that isn't actually due us. Another way that we can steal, and this one's really common, we steal from our employers at work by not really working while we're there and we're doing other things on their time, all the while drawing a salary, supposed to be working, but we're not. Um, this is epidemic. I saw some figures on this, and the figures were in the hundreds of millions of dollars every year that employers are losing by employees who are, you know, you're on Facebook, you have to check a few things, you know, whatever it might be, and we're not there being diligent workers. What God would call us to is whatever we're doing, we do it as unto the Lord with all of our hearts. And so as the people of God, we don't want to steal from our employers, but we want to work hard while we're there. Now, one more way. How do we, how do we steal by defrauding or misrepresenting? We can do so on our taxes, and this is almost like we kind of brag about it around here. You know what I mean? Like, oh, got her down to zero. Didn't have to pay anything or whatever it might be for you. Um, we should take advantage of any um, options that we have to, you know, hey, this offsets my income a little bit. Any sorts of deductions that we have, we should go ahead and take advantage of those. Those are written in the law. We should take advantage. And yet, if we take one more penny than what is ultimately due us, people of God, we've stolen and what God has said to us is that we should render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. And so um, if you're um, depressing your income, you're not claiming forms of income that are there, or you're overstating your deductions, you're stealing from our government. So as the people of God, we should strive to be honest in all of our deal dealings, to never take what is not ours, whether it be property or people or even rep misrepresenting ourselves, in order to um, take from somebody what doesn't belong to us. There's a passage in Proverbs that, man, I I've thought on it quite a lot because it goes so against the grain of, of how we tend to think as a culture. And the writer of Proverbs, he's laying out this wisdom, and it's almost a form of a prayer. And in Proverbs chapter 30, he goes on and he says, uh, God, don't give me so much that I have a tendency to forget you. Don't give me so much wealth and so many riches that I think that I don't need God. I can handle all this, that I don't remember that every single day, every single moment that I need the Lord. Don't give me so much that I have a tendency to forget you. And don't give me so little. Lead me to poverty that I might be tempted to steal. As the people of God, He is our provider, and we should live our lives like God has provided for us exactly what we need. We can trust Him to care for us and to provide for us, and if God hasn't giving, given something to us, we can trust that it is ultimately for our good. Now, if you, you want something you don't have, you can pray to the Lord about that. Hey, God, I'd like to own a home one day. 
God, I would love to have this thing, to be able to send my kid to college or whatever it might be. We can pray for that. We just can't steal that, okay? So um, I told you about the, the housing crisis and why I thought it ultimately amounted to theft. Um, here are some of the causes of the housing crisis. This was not all bankers, but there were some bankers. In order to enrich themselves in their banks, they would steer t- people toward higher interest rate loans. Generally, they were variable rate interest loans. Um, and so they would steer people there, and they would be loaded down with fees that would, um, really, they made banks wealthy. So they're running buyers through like crazy. Hey, you can afford this. Just take this loan. It'll be great for you. Um, when they knew that the people ultimately probably couldn't afford those loans. So they misrepresented something in order to enrich themselves. But it wasn't just the banks. Um, Of the foreclosures that took place in the first year of the 2008 financial crisis, 70% of the people who were foreclosed on were found to have lied on their loan application documents. So they went in because they wanted something they couldn't afford. They lied to the bank. They said they had more income or assets than they really had. And so when things got tougher financially, they couldn't pay also found a significant percentage of people defaulted because they were sold homes by people who had papered over significant problems, um, investors, flippers, whatever, and their house was found to be in much worse shape than it was represented. Over and over and over, people were lying in order to enrich themselves. They were stealing from somebody else. Now, we're tempted oftentimes to think, well, you know, it's just a big old company. It's a wealthy person. They won't even notice it. But God does. And our God has called us to holiness, to be men and women of integrity in everything that we do, to ultimately trust Him that He's going to give us everything we need and then some. So we choose to walk in integrity, to model the faithfulness of our Lord, even when we want the things that we we don't currently have. Now, if you're here today and you find that you've stolen The call for you is the same call that we would offer every week, is to repent, to acknowledge that as sin, and to bring it before the Lord. Um, There's no sin so great that God can't forgive you. There was a a man who actually operated um, a slave ship. The year was 1728. He was on the slave ship Greyhound, um, and he encountered a storm that was worse than any he'd ever seen. As a matter of fact, his crew actually tied him to the helm of the ship um, in hopes that he could remain there and pilot the ship through the storm. And as, you know, storms often do, it brought clarity into his mind. He began to think about what mattered in life. He began to think about what he was doing, the things that he knew about God. And there in the midst of that terrible storm, he cried out to the Lord to save him. He was known by his crewmates as a vile man. He was filthy. He was a thief. He'd abused and mistreated people. The man's name was John Newton, who penned the words to the song that many of you probably know. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. What I want you to know today, if you find yourself here and you're, you're a thief, you've stolen, maybe you've committed adultery or murder, Jesus is a greater Savior than you are a sinner. As a matter of fact, Jesus was crucified between two criminals. Tradition tells us these men were thieves. Luke chapter 23, beginning in verse 34, it tells the story. Jesus has already been beaten beyond recognition. He'd endured the cat of nine tails. He'd been insulted by everyone. They spat in his face. He carried that rough-hewn timber of the cross on his shoulders until he collapsed. They'd stretched him out there. They'd driven nails through his wrists and through his ankles. And they stood that cross up. And as it fell into place, Jesus begins to pray this prayer in Luke chapter 23. Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. And they divided his clothes and they cast lots. The people stood watching, and even the leaders were scoffing. He saved others. Let him save himself. If this is God's Messiah, the chosen one, hey, Jesus, if you're the Christ, why don't you save yourself? The soldiers also mocked him. They came offering him sour wine and said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. If you're the king, why don't you command your armies, Jesus, save yourself? 
Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, Don't you even fear God? Since you are undergoing the same punishment, we are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things that we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. While the leaders were scoffing and mocking Jesus, while the soldiers were mocking the Christ, while the other criminal was busy insulting him, the thief on the cross, he came to understand that he was a sinner. Don't you even fear God since you were undergoing the same punishment? We are punished justly. We're getting back what we deserve for the things that we did. The thief on the cross came to recognize that he was a sinner and ultimately that he was deserving of punishment. And that sinner who knew that he deserved his punishment also came to recognize that Jesus was the Savior, that he was the Messiah. And there on the cross, the thief didn't do anything to earn the favor of Jesus. He didn't get baptized and go to church for six months. He didn't try to earn the favor of God, do enough good things to balance out the bad things. There on the cross, that thief who knew that he was a sinner deserving of punishment, he just cried out to the Savior, and Jesus saved him today. You will be with me in paradise. We don't receive the gospel by our works. We don't receive the gospel by our good deeds. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. If you're here today, you're a sinner. And you've done the things you ought never do. You can't even speak about some of the things that you've done, the place that you've gone. Maybe you've turned your back on God. I want you to know that Jesus is a greater sinner or Savior, then you are a sinner. When you find yourself convicted of your sin, you look to Jesus, the Messiah, as your Savior. You cry out to Him. Now today, we're going to have a time of communion where we remember the work of Jesus Christ for us. We remember that body that was offered up. Remember what He endured when He was beaten the nails through his wrists and his ankles, that body that was offered up for us. He endured the punishment that we deserved. We remember the blood that he shed, the blood of a new covenant for the forgiveness of our sins. The Last Supper, Jesus gathered his disciples. They're sitting there for this final meal. He takes a loaf of bread and he began to break it and gave it to them. He says, this is my body, which is for you. Take and eat this. The disciples didn't know fully what that meant, but they would come to know very quickly as they saw him endure what he endured. They saw the cross. They remembered that his body had been offered up for them. Then he took the cup. He said, "This this is my blood. It's the blood of a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus' blood was shed that we could experience forgiveness in Jesus' name. So today, we just want to remember what Jesus did for us. I'm going to say a word of prayer and invite the deacons to come down, and we're going to have a time of communion. Would you bow with me? Oh, Father, we are the thief. God, we're sinners who deserve death for our sin. We deserve to be separated from you. But you're the Messiah. You're the Savior of the world. You're the one who died there on the cross for us. You died that we might find life. Your body was offered up and your blood was shed that we might find forgiveness in your name. That we might not live broken and empty lives that are marred by sin. But instead that we could walk in the light. We can live lives of hope and peace in Jesus' name. Lord, we receive these elements with thanksgiving for what you have done. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.